we set out to create Cobalt 27, we were thinking about how do you capture that disruption as an investor? Like, what is the best way? And what we realized was it's tremendously challenging because while we can all agree that these changes are coming and you can't really stop them, mm -hmm. what, what we weren't able to kind of nail down was how do you play? Like, do you buy Tesla stock? I don't know. Maybe actually Ford is going to be the winner. Potentially Beijing Auto. Like, we, I don't know. Um, maybe you should buy NVIDIA, the chip maker. Maybe you buy one of the sensor makers. And then we realized something, which is so long as you believe that there's going to be a winner, so long as you believe that there are going to be electric vehicles sold, the winner is actually basic materials. And the reason is, is because every single electric vehicle, every single hybrid is going to have a battery. And that battery is a lithium ion battery that has lithium, nickel, you know, cobalt, mm -hmm. manganese, you know, these basic materials. And so we set out to create a proxy for the adoption of the electric vehicle, the disruption of the energy industry, and that proxy is really Cobalt 27. Okay, so I think there's a general acceptance that people are moving towards you know, electric vehicles, batteries, whatever they do, storage for homes, yeah, businesses, storage, et cetera. Like all, it's, it's all coming, coming down the line, and there's a lot of information in the marketplace about that. So tell me a little bit about your strategy, because a lot of companies come to us without a business plan. Yeah. They have no written business plan, which surprises me, uh, having worked outside of this space. So tell me a bit about your strategy and why you think that's going to give you the edge. Yeah, so it's very simple. Uh, we have uh, copied, in a way, Franco Nevada or Wheaton Precious's business model, which is streams and royalties. You know, we are not miners. We go out and we seek to uh, do streams and royalties with world-class partners. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, the first Cobalt stream ever done, mm -hmm. we did uh, with uh, Valet. So Valet is a world-class mining operation, right? Mm -hmm. So they're the operator of the mine. If you look at a transaction that we're in the process of closing, it's a nickel cobalt mine, once again, in operation. MCC yeah. uh, is the operator. So the business model is very similar to the Francos and Wheatons of the world who focus on precious metals. But what we've said is we're going to replicate that business model, but focus on the battery metals, particular nickel and cobalt, that are absolutely critical to the lithium ion battery. But you also have some physical products as exactly. well, I notice, and some uh, interest in other battery metals as well. So it's, it's not a sort of pure play, royalty play, is it? No, I mean, you know, you have to kind of um, play the hand you've been dealt, as it were. Mm -hmm. And because of the specialty nature of uh, cobalt and nickel, uh, we had to be a bit creative. And mm -hmm. when we launched the company, we actually launched with 2,000, approximately 2,000 metric tons of cobalt, mm -hmm. and then we bought another 900 tons subsequently, you know, a few months after but launch. But why, why do that? What, what are you doing? Hedging? Well, no, so that was, that was the foundation of the balance sheet. So, right. um, you know, when you have a physical commodity like that, you can actually take leverage. Right. And in the early days, we wanted to build the balance sheet so that we could do the subsequent transactions like the acquisition of the uh, royalty on Boise's Bay or the Dumont, the Dumont royalty. So that was really a strategy around building a balance sheet. So, so how, does, how does that work? You're, you're, you're leveraging that? Why wouldn't you just sell that into the market? So we, um, we haven't used leverage to this point. However, we have a credit facility available to actually leverage it. There's a couple hundred million bucks. Yeah, exactly. So uh, why, why don't we sell it? You know, I think one of the things, so I've talked briefly about the fact that we've replicated the Franco Nevada model. Mm. I think one differentiated aspect of our business is we're creating an ethically sourced supply chain. So everything we do is outside of the Congo. And you know, we can talk about it later, but there are a lot of issues around conflict minerals with cobalt in the Congo. And so one of the things in having this physical cobalt position, having the Voices Bay stream, you have flow of material, as it were, which is all outside of the Congo. So at some future date, if a battery maker, an automobile maker, uh, wants to step in and actually take that material, it's mm. another available source. So we sort of see ourselves, in addition to copying the streaming and royalty model, we're actually creating a conflict-free supply chain outside of the Congo. Okay, I was going to ask you about this later, actually. So explain to people what's going on in the, in the DRC, which makes that problematic for you as an ethical sourcer. Yeah, so, so to be very clear, we have zero investments in the Congo and we've told everyone categorically that we're not going to invest there. That's a very important point. Right. But what's going on there is very straightforward. Some of the highest grade copper 
Um, some of the highest grade ores actually sit inside of the Congo. And what happened uh, and has happened for cassiterite, which is tin, and a bunch of other mm -hmm. materials over, over the course of the last 20 years, is that when a given uh, basic material's price gets sufficiently high, it's actually economic for literally an individual to go out there with a shovel, right. dig up like the, the ore, the and article. put it in a sack and sell right. it, right? And so, right. Um, you know, what, what happened and has been happening for a long time with, with cobalt in particular, but a bunch of other metals have suffered the same fate, including copper and, and, and considerate and, and tantalum, and, right. uh, is that uh, you know, in these situations where they're very poor, um, you know, people bring their kids along, and so you, you have people who are missing school, or you have a, a family member, a friend, who's kind of having this child who might be 10, 12, I think there's some you know, great Wall Street Journal reporting on this, and, and Global Witness has reported on this, mm -hmm. Uh, they're having these children out there digging this um, this ore that's ultimately getting put into the supply chain. Uh, where we come in is we're saying, look, we can't fix that problem. I believe people can fix that problem, but we're not unable to fix that problem. And so what we're offering is a product where none of our material touches any of that supply chain. Um, and and what we think is, you know, the early adopters of electric vehicles, in particular in like the U.S. and Canada and Europe. Mm. Um, yeah, I think they're green individuals. Like they, they care about the environment. And so I think that they care about the supply chain of the materials that comprise a lot of electric vehicle. And they want to know that, um, that their new name, the name of the car, is actually not having conflict cobalt inside of it. Is this, is this a, a marketing thing? I mean, are we saying that these companies are, will find it easier to market a green product? Well, it's ethical. Versus, I, mean, I, know it's ethical. I know it's ethical, but you know, there's a kind of balance between is it, a, is it a gimmick for marketers or is it a genuine concern for these countries? Uh, I think in the companies, I think, I think it's also a legal concern. I mean, you know, if you're, right. uh, you know, there are, um, sorry, there are laws like in the US I'm familiar with. Right. You, you can't be like, uh, you can be selling a product with known conflict materials. I mean, uh, you know, so you run into legal issues. So I think mm. it's twofold. I think there's just an ethical issue, but I think there's also um, a legal issue. And look, I do believe that with time, you know, companies are thinking about ways with blockchain and, and different technology mm. to bag and tag, which is what they did with tin. Mm. Um, meaning, you know, you go all the way back to the source, you put it into a bag that you can verify, and then they put a barcode on it. None of these systems are perfect, mm. uh, but none of them properly exist for cobalt yet. So, uh, you, well, yeah, you, you say they're not perfect. So, but who measures uh, or monitors what is and is not ethical? And then you say so it doesn't places. exist. I mean, really, right. really. I mean, I think if you're um, a cathode maker, a battery maker, an automobile maker, at the moment, what you do is you buy directly from large mechanized miners. So you buy from a Glencore or a Valley, yeah. because I do believe that those companies are able to look through the supply chain. Right. But, but I think there's only so much cobalt that's produced by those companies. Right. And so as soon as you step into like an aggregator, I think you start to enter a pretty murky space, right. uh, which we're completely avoiding. And you know, people are making efforts to clean it up. It right. just will take time. And in, in Congo? Well, what, they're, what generally... they're doing is they're, they're trying to create tracking systems. Um, there's a couple companies trying with blockchain chain technology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to really be able to demonstrate that we're talking about cobalt, but this could be true of any of the materials. Like, look, okay, here's your car, and by the way, here's the manifest, and you know, the cobalt came from here, and, and it's sort of ethically sourced. But you know, it's a very complex issue, and I'll give you an example. Sure. If you're a, um, a refiner or a processor, and you have 15 sources of cobalt, uh, you know, 14 of them may be legitimate, but if the 15 one isn't, it all gets mixed get up and, it's, and it taints the yeah. whole, uh, the whole, you know, and the LME, by the way, uh, the London Metals Exchange, you know, they've announced that they're taking steps to, to try to look back into the supply chain. And so I think people are aware of the issue. It's just very complex and it's not going to be something that's just sorted out, you know, like that. It's going to take years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I guess in the meantime, there's always going to be a market for what your term, you know, you're determining is, well, and others are determining as um, unethical or not green. Well, I mean, there's always, there's always going to be, a, yeah, there will be that market, but I, I can tell you, we spend a lot of time in, in China. I was in Beijing last week, yeah. and, and uh, there's this kind of idea that the Chinese don't care, and I think that's completely false. 
I mean, I mean like I can tell you, like, we were with a lot of major automakers, battery makers. They're acutely aware of this problem as well, right. and and they care also. I mean, you know, they uh, in China, and, and we can talk about this. You know, China is really setting uh, environmental policy globally around the adoption of electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. You know, the intention there is ultimately not to sell you a battery, but to sell you a car. So you're driving your Beijing auto car in London. Like that's going to be the future. But setting that yeah. aside, so they're acutely aware of this problem, and I can tell you that you know the Chinese consumers who are making these electric vehicles, they don't want to buy this stuff either. And and so um, the problem isn't like, you know, it's a global problem, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, and we can probably come come on to China later because they seem to be leading from the front on a, certainly in the battery space at the, at the moment. So tell me a little bit about you. You come from a financial background. This, I think you position this as a financial play, that what you've constructed here. So. Tell us a bit about, about you, how that's informed your thinking and, and the strategy of the business. Yeah, so I, look, I've spent my career primarily as a resource investor, mm -hmm. uh, investing primarily in metals and mining, but also oil and gas to mm -hmm. a lesser extent yeah. um, in, in, you know, in Europe and, and New York. And it, it has highly informed the business because we really are taking like a risk-adjusted return portfolio approach. Mm -hmm. you know, we try to dilute concentration risk. We have you know multiple royalties across a number of jurisdictions, but all battery metals related. All, all really at the moment, nickel and cobalt related. Just those two. Just Would you really be looking at the other battery metals as well? You know, look, I think our investors are primarily interested in that class one nickel okay. that goes directly into the chemical industry mm -hmm. and cobalt, mm -hmm. and so that's the focus. I mean, there are lithium miners, so you you can actually go right. buy a lithium company. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, there are actually a lot of copper miners as well, mm -hmm. but. Cobalt as a byproduct is very hard to invest in. In fact, I don't think there's any real legitimate way. Right. Um, and then you know the kind of nickel that goes into batteries. Once again, it's it's a harder play. Mm -hmm. And so we have that focus. And then within that focus, we have this portfolio approach of multiple royalties and streams across multiple jurisdictions. And so in a lot of ways, it's kind of um, trying to uh, you know kind of diversify risk yeah. such that you're you know if one asset something happened, you you sort of don't causing yeah. a cataclysmic problem for the business. So tell me about, I mean, roy royalties is an interesting space. There's not that many players in it. How do you, as uh, an investor in, the, in, in space, this is a financial product for you, do you have any say in what the company's doing or are you just looking at the balance sheets each week and going, it's working, Yeah, no, it's I mean, working? so you, there are like, I mean, each one of the great things about the product is very bespoke. So each, mm. each royalty or stream is addressing a specific concern, a specific situation for that company. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the reasons I think why the company is like it is, is you're not running their business. Yeah. Right? Like this is their business. You're, but do you have a say in it? Uh, you definitely don't have a say, but right. but the, the structure is such mm -hmm. that you do have protections. I mean, you have minimum throughput. Right. You know, you're covering, um, you know, the entire mine, because like if you just as by way of example, if you just focused on a little area, yeah. you could create an incentive to mine a different part of the mine. So so you structure the contract. And, and remember, you know, the industry has been around for over a decade now. And so right. people have kind of learned from some of the early mistakes. Sure, sure. Um, but, but what I would say is you're definitely not operating that business. Uh, and through the structuring of the contract, you have protections. Right. But but it's a very hands off, light touch approach. So. You the hard work for you is determining which companies to invest in and structuring the agreement. Yeah, and also getting them interested, you know, because when you're, sure. when you're dealing with a, a, a counterparty that, that is potentially a large, a large miner, you know, there has to be a reason why they want to do it as well. They're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're producing, they've got options, and it's a question of what's the cost, cost of cost capital, them, for yeah, sure. exactly. All so, of that kind of good stuff. Um, so, so what do you spend your time doing then? If, if, if you're sitting back looking at numbers, I mean, what's, what's your time spent on doing? Are you looking at M&A opportunities constantly? Yeah, so we have a list of probably almost every single nickel and cobalt nice. project in the world. I mean, legit, like, right. like, like it's an Excel document. Right. And, you know, we track very closely the mm -hmm. life cycle, where the companies are at. And then we have kind of a, a short list mm. of situations. Um, Companies that you may not even realize, I, mean, I won't say them publicly, sure. but that you may not even realize produce nickel or cobalt. Mm. And maybe there's a capital expansion announced. So, well, or they're, they're fixing the refinery. You say, well, hold on a second. Yeah. They don't even show that there's nickel there, but we know there is. So they're getting no credit for that nickel. So what yeah. if we come to them and say, mm. here's $100 million, just by way of example. Sure. 
And then there would be other companies that would be moving along the development um, kind of timeline. And then there'd be divestitures and maybe a company's buying another company and they need asset finance. And so they're really buying a nickel project. So there's yeah. all these different situations and we monitor them. Mm -hmm.